My name is Stephen Vitello. I'm chair of Kinetic Imaging and very happily um, Hope Ginsburg, who is tonight's speaker, is now in Kinetic Imaging. Um, she was in AFO and painting for 17 years, but whereas most you know, students take a year, it took her a while to get out of AFO and into KI. But we're, um, I know it's a dumb joke. I think I told that joke already. But anyway, um, we're, we're super happy to um, have her in, in our program. And I feel like we're all very fortunate for her to be giving this evening's lecture. Um, my couple notes. After, after the talk, there'll be a Q&A session um, for our friends who are um, joining us virtually, which is, I imagine, thousands. Um, there's a Q&A function. So please put your questions in the chat and we'll get your questions. Um, okay, I'm going to read Hope's bio and then step aside. Uh, Hope Ginsburg is a project-based artist whose work integrates video, performance, and social practice. She's exhibited in, nationally and internationally at venues such as MoMA, PS1, Mass MoCo, Wexner Center for the Arts, USF Contemporary Art Museum, which I think is now in Florida, um, Institute of Contemporary Art, VCU, Baltimore Museum of Art, Sculpture Center, there's a lot, I'm going to skip some, but there's all really good things. Um, her projects have been, received support from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Arts, and Women in Philanthropy at the Ohio State University. She's a recipient of a Wexner Center for the, uh, for the Arts Residency and an award in film and video, a VMFA fellowship in film and video, um, an Art Matters Foundation grant, Ginsburg has attended residencies such as Robert Rauschenberg Residency, Skowhegan, Wexner Center. Again, all really good things. Um, writing about her work has appeared in Art Forum, Hyperallergic, The New York Times, and The Wall Street Journal. Hope Ginsburg holds a Master of Science in Visual Studies from MIT and a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Sculpture from Tyler School of Art. Okay, please welcome Hope Ginsburg. Am I on? Okay, thank you for that, Stephen. Thanks for inviting me over to KI too. Um, uh, very heartfelt thanks to Dean Higginbotham for inviting me to give the lecture tonight and to Dean Lafazzani from the Office of Research for having me too. And um, also warm thanks to Kelly Kerr for um, managing the proceedings. Anyway, thanks for being here. Um, I'm going to get started if everything goes according to plan here. There we go. I'm going to start where else, but with the world's, the planet's uh, first multicellular organism, the sea sponge, which was a muse of mine from 2006 to 2016 and beyond. And, um, and Stephen's even in the poster where our lecture begins. So um, this is a poster for an exhibition at Solvent Space in Richmond that took place when I arrived at VCU. And just to say a little bit about this sponge project, because what I'm doing is sort of laying some groundwork for how I got to the Meditation Ocean project, uh, which I'll be focusing on in the second half of the talk. So sponge was a workshop model. It was all about exchange. It was all about teaching and learning. So sponges are great exchangers. Um, they are filter feeders on the reef, taking in uh, nutrition, breaking it down, feeding other creatures on the reef. Um, and I mentioned that they were the first multicellular organism. <clears throat> you can see that all of these little balloon-like shapes in their bodies um, have these little flagella or tails. And that's because they, um, they were originally coanoflagellate single-celled organisms that came together in this first multicellular organism and formed their coanocyte cells. And one thing that that um, suggests to me, if you'll take this liberty with me, is that they're kind of an originating model of collectivity or collaboration. And um, sponges were, until the late 19th century, the late 18th century, they were mistaken for plants. They have no central nervous system. So that's kind of humble. But, um, but I'm really interested in this notion of exchange and collaboration. And so in sponge workshops, which were meant to be interdisciplinary, 
participants all taught something back to the rest of the group. And it was really meant to be a kind of um, a kind of a kind of hierarchy flipper between experts and learners. And so you saw in the poster some of the workshops that took place in this um, in this exhibition. And then in, I guess it was around 2010, after I'd been here for a few years, the amazing Ash Ashley Kistler invited Sponge to be a project in residence at the Anderson. So um, Chase Westfall, who I saw here, has kept the Sponge Gallery name alive. And so if anyone ever wondered why that gallery on the third floor of the Anderson is called Sponge, it's because the Sponge headquarters used to be there, acting as a kind of interdisciplinary mixer at the school. I don't know if I mentioned yet that, um, that sponges don't move. So it was really meant to plant at the school the way a sea sponge plants on a marine reef, acting as a kind of filter exchanger. And um, workshops were held there, classes, um, music was held there. And you can see through the portal window that's still up there on the third floor, um, the aquarium of the freshwater aquarium that was in the sponge headquarters. There was also an indoor top bar beehive with honeybees flying in and out of the building and we made our own honey. And there were curricula that the sponge generated. So one such class was called Collab Lab Lab. And, um, and it, was the, it was a collaborative lab about a lab, of course. And the way Collab Lab Lab worked is that I registered for a student, I registered as a student at VCU and I took an undergrad, um, biology class, and then all the students in Collab Lab Lab had to take, we all took biology together. So the class took a class. It was the collaborative lab about the lab. And the students made a Collab Lab Lab blog. They made a Collab Lab Lab book. And those students that went through this, this exchange with the biology department became the first monitors of the sponge headquarters. So they would open it several days a week to the public and share what was going on in, in sponge. So all of this sponge love um, led to an opportunity to learn to scuba dive so that I could actually go, am I jumping in and out of frame? Should I like stay in one spot? I'm okay, okay, I'm a little bit of a peripatetic being unlike my muses. Anyway, I learned to dive so that I could see living ones because really I'd only known their, um, their skeletons. And what that did was inspire more actual um, object making, um, more material exploration. And so what you're seeing here is just a, a documentation image from a project that the Sponge Headquarters collaborators um, and monitors and I made together. And it was ultimately for a workshop that we took for um, a swarming project hosted by Mildred's Lane at the Museum of Modern Art. So there were many collaborations with the students who moved through the sponge, um, always credited in the, in the outcomes of those projects. And then a kind of far flung example of a sponge HQ activity was for the ninth Mercosul Biennial in Porto Alegre, Brazil. And you're seeing Dr. Cecilia Folkma Ribeiro in the middle of the image. And she named that genus of very flashy freshwater sponge when she was a sophomore in college. And so with the mediators from the biennial and students from VCU who came to Brazil to work with me on this project, we recreated the sponge out of handmade felt dyed with plant and insect pigments. And so that was our version of the encrusting river sponge on view in that exhibition on a former, um, in a former thermoelectric plant on the Guayuba Lagoon. But maybe just a quick word about the sense of the sponge being, um, you know, an interconnected series of organisms. The sense of felt being an interlocking, randomly interlocking textile of fiber. Um, the work with bees really points to the kind of macro organism of the hive and all of these individual animals kind of working as a larger organism. Oops. I'm gonna talk over this a little bit 
because in 2013, I went on a dive to go see um, barrel sponges off the coast of Puerto Rico. I wanted to see these large sponges. And I had this moment, um, I brought this little like cheapo um, digital camera down to shoot the sponges and soft corals on this reef. And I had this moment of, of taking a breath in and all of the soft corals swayed one way. And then I exhaled and they all swayed the other way. And I just had this kind of aha moment of breathing, there we go, of breathing with the ocean. And so this was a moment when the notion of breathing and diving or scuba diving and awareness of the breath kind of synced up for me. And I also learned to dive not long after recovering from an accident in which I broke up uh, my sternum and a bone in my spine. And so walking with the tank on my back and diving with the tank and being able to do it is really what indicated to me that a kind of healing had taken place. And so I'm saying all this just to connect the dots between diving and healing and an awareness of the breath, or if you will, meditation. And so in 2014, I went to be an artist in residence at the Rauschenberg Residency on Captiva, Florida. And by that point, I'd been working on the sponge project for a very long time. And I started to think a little bit more um, autobiographically, or I just was thinking about switching gears a little bit um, in this residency. And so I came to the residency with this notion of making an underwater video that would reenact this, um, this accident that I had recovered from. And one of the scenes I wanted for this underwater video that I imagined was a group of people either meditating or doing yoga on land with scuba gear. So this was just this sort of image that came to me. And so the other residents uh, were so generous and they were willing to participate in a scuba meditation um, that I thought was to gather footage for a video. And so this is the first of 15 land dives that I made between 2014 and 2020. And so what we're doing, what we're doing here is we're we're really experiencing a kind of augmented meditation with the scuba gear. And so if you've if you've dived before, you know that when you inhale, you can't help but ignore the kind of rush of air that's coming through the regulator. And when you exhale, you hear it too. And so there's this kind of amplified soundscape of breath in a group of meditating divers. And so what I thought would be um, what I thought would be moving forward as a video actually kind of turned into its own project. There was something about this augmented meditation with the scuba um, that really suggested uh, that, that suggested sort of sticking with it. And then what flowed in was all of the all of the interest in the site where we were doing this practice. So for example, this is at the Rice River Center Wetlands at VCU. And this talk, you know, this talk kind of runs alongside my life here at school. And um, Maybe just to say it feels really special to be able to kind of share all this work at home. Um, but so here we are at the Rice River Center wetland practicing um, practicing this meditation in a, a formerly dammed area of the wetlands that decimated um, bald cypress and tupelo gum trees downriver from a, an epic chemical dumping situation in Hopewell, Virginia, that created a large scale fishing ban in the James River. And all of this was being remediated. The dam was removed, the wetlands were being remediated. And so as we sat in this formerly toxic mud, there was just this suggestion of how this project that was about paying attention could lend itself to thinking about sight and awareness of sight. And so this is the moment when this practice of breathing with gear to think about kind of individual and group well-being kind of knitted over into the landscape or into the site. But what also happened on this dive is that the James River is a diurnal river. The tide 
goes up and down twice a day. So there are two tidal changes in the James River each day. And, and so the water of the river just started to kind of creep up onto the muddy shore where we were sitting. And that suggested a version of this project where we would sit in meditation as water flowed in and rose on our bodies until we disappeared. And so I just wanna segue now to Land Dive Team Bay of Fundy, which was the first kind of fully expressed video production that came out of the Land Dive Team body of work. It was actually part of the declaration show here at the ICA. So it's nice to be back, um, nice to be back at the ICA. And so when I say meditation, maybe just, um, maybe just nice to get specific about that for a moment and also take a breath myself. I'm really talking about coming into awareness of the present moment experience, maybe using the breath as an anchor for that, checking in on what that feels like in the body, but also noticing anything that's arising, anything that's arising in the mind or the experience and meeting that without judgment or meeting that with kindness or meeting that with some degree of acceptance. And so the connection that this work makes is, is the potential of a practice like that, of an awareness practice that supports staying in attention, the potential that has to allow us to meet or come to or sustain attention around the climate crisis, around the terror of that, around the reality of that, around the anxiety of that. Um, and so I'm going to show you um, I'm going to show you just a short clip of Land Dive Team Bay of Fundy. And then also just want to say that, um, that this was the first moment that a team of collaborators really came into constellation um, around this work. And those collaborators have kind of, we've worked together on all of the subsequent projects. So, um, so Joshua Quarles, uh, who is a musician and um, also collaborator and also my partner did the score for this piece. Uh, Matt Flowers, a friend and collaborator, did the videography and a former undergraduate student who I happen to have in Time Studio at AFO whoop, whoop, um, was on camera too. And um, so I'm just gonna show you a couple minutes of this piece and um, maybe it's just a chance also to all land back in our bodies, in our seats and have a breath. Very tiny, the numbers I'm gonna guess. A short clip from a video that's about six minutes long and shot on the shore of the Bay of Fundy, which is um, on the coast of St. John, New Brunswick in Canada. And Fundy, as you may know, is between New Brunswick and Maine. 
and Nova Scotia, and it has the highest tide rise on the planet. So it goes up and down 50 feet twice a day. Um, and so a place to kind of get this image of rising water, which after summer 2023 and last weekend, we're seeing with um, harrowing frequency. So this um, dream team of Josh, Matt, and I kind of came together again in the summer of 2017 to shoot in underwater coral restoration nurseries off the coast of um, off the coast of St. Croix. So Matt Flowers was living there for a year with his family doing underwater coral restoration. And this practice of tending to and outplanting Atlantic hard coral to save it from um, warming waters and all bleaching all of these threats that coral are facing, um, to me seemed like an absolutely fascinating swirling of factors. What's to keep this outplanted coral that gets snipped from these um, snipped from these trees and literally pasted back down onto the reef? And I'll just actually get this playing while I talk. Um, that gets literally pasted back down on the reef. What's to keep this coral from meeting the same fate as all of the other hard corals that have um, had such a hard time because of because of bleaching, because of the warming water, and so it really feels like a story that swirls and doesn't land because also as soon as these corals are pasted back down onto the reef fish immediately come back and have habitat. So there's really just this question about kind of um, human ingenu ingenuity and human folly, but also in this work, which is ultimately a four channel video installation. Viewers are asked to kind of swirl and take in all of these um, all of these looping vignettes and kind of piece together the puzzle of what is happening there. And we named the piece after the swirling reef of death. And so just sharing a little bit of this piece, the irony of all of the plastic that's being used to tend to these corals. Just give you a little volume out there. And so um, the three of us actually worked together again this summer on a shorter piece called Swirling Postcard to kind of revisit what was happening at these outplant sites. Um, and we shot in May and finished in June just before Atlantic temperatures, Atlantic ocean temperatures kind of skyrocketed and all of the coral restoration work shifted to pulling coral samples out of the ocean to allow them to weather this hopefully, you know, resolving heat instance on land. So if the land dive team body of work makes the proposal about practicing presence or presence awareness to maintain a kind of focus or be able to grapple with the changing climate, what Swirling proposes is a kind of laboring with other species for shared survival. What you're seeing is that the coral are tended to in the nursery to clean them and protect them from worms that bore into the coral, from invasive algae, from fire coral. So they're kind of tended in these nurseries on these spindly PVC trees. And then they're taken by boat or literally, as you saw, hand carried across the ocean floor for out planting on the reef. And then as you see, the fish have habitat. So, um, so, really a swirling. I'm gonna cut that a little short in the name of time and just show you 
um, three of the four channels of the swirling installation installed at University of South Florida Contemporary Art Museum in 2019. Um, curated by, a, 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 uh, by Sarah Howard, who later went on to be in the Meditation Ocean dive team. But what I want to do with this installation image on the screen is kind of knit together sponge and land dive team and the indoor ocean of swirling and just suggest how this work led to making Meditation Ocean. So there was an interest in, so the sponge headquarters closed in 2016 and the land dive team body of work kind of picked up from there. And there was an interest in returning to this notion of, um, of a pedagogical project, an interdisciplinary project organizing around teaching and learning that would speak to, um, speak to climate, speak to environment, speak to our relationship, our, our, our intrinsic being part of the natural world, but how to do it. And there was a little phase where I was thinking of a land dive team for um, a land dive shop for breathing on land. And there was, but there was just this thought about how accessible it was to get people and scuba gear to sites to make this work happen. And there was something about the installation of swirling that suggested that the ocean could be made as an indoor accessible space that people could come to, to breathe with, to sit with the wildlife living there on the reef and to sit with each other. And so the kind of teaching and learning of sponge and the sighted um, breath awareness practice of land dive team and the installation suggested by swirling kind of led to, um, didn't kind of led to making meditation ocean. And so what I'm showing you now is a six channel installation that was on view from February to July at the Wexner Center for the Arts. And the first iteration of what I hope will be an, an ongoing project so that each meditation ocean is an MO, is a kind of, um, is an MO. And um, so this was the first iteration called MO Turtle Grass Meadow. And just to, just to sort of, say very plainly that it's a six channel video installation with ambient score, with guided meditations, and I'll talk more about this, seating and public programming. So there was, um, there was this thought about bringing together a video installation space and a platform for engagement. So how could this ocean, how could this porous, porous space be programmed both in the space to meet with community and how could um, aspects of the project go out into the community. Um, really this notion of making the seabed, of making this um, threatened environment upon which so many people depend for um, food, sustenance and livelihood, making it visible, making it accessible to an audience. And what would it feel like to breathe with a team of meditating scuba divers on the seabed? And the piece really also began with a thought about aiming towards youth. I think it really held that, but opened up past that. But there was a notion that if we got the viewer to the seabed, that we could have a team of meditating divers come in and sit with the kids or the teens and model the practice. Um, so that was kind of the thought behind Meditation Ocean. And the space, as I mentioned, had six screens. So there was a triptych, which you're seeing here, a diptych, and a single channel screen. So from a behind the scenes perspective, that really allowed us to edit in panorama, to edit in pairs, and to create these sort of single channel focal points. I'm gonna take a sip of water before I talk about Meditation Ocean Constellation, which is a really important aspect of this work and the title of the talk. So, so Meditation Ocean and the first iteration, MO Turtle Grass Meadow, is credited to the Meditation Ocean Constellation. So every, you know, the 50 plus people that lent their expertise, their knowledge, their care to this work, we share credit 
um, collaboratively. And that's meant to pull some of the ecological principles of the work, principles of, of interconnection, principles of, you know, kind of non-singularity. Um, it, it really became a constellation of people or an ecology, or if you'll take this leap with me, a sponge. So just scrolling here, um, mentioning that the piece was supported by the Wexner Center for the Arts uh, Film Video Studio, by, um, by an Artist Residency Award from the Wexner Center, um, Alexis McCrimmon, who edited, the, who edited Swirling, Matt, who, um, who shot Swirling, Josh, who scored it, came on board for sound, um, Jennifer Lang, Meditation and Ocean, producer, curator, who saw um, Land Dive Team Bay of Fundy and swirling through, came on board to be part of the Meditation Ocean Constellation. And then a really important point to make here, and also probably like many people that we know and love from the VCU arts community, including four vocalists from the School of Music. Um, really important maybe to say here is that the piece was a the piece was sort of equal parts film video studio and equal parts learning and public practice. So the learning and public practice department of the Wexner Center came on board as an equal production partner to think through all of the programming that would move through this, this meditation ocean. So where were we? Um, we were shooting with um, three crop sensor DSLRs on weighted tripods about 20 feet down um, on a reef called Alina's Reef in Biscayne National Park in the Florida Keys. So Biscayne National Park, not the same as Key Biscayne, but at the top of the Keys chain, kind of east of Totten Key, east of Homestead, Florida. And we shot in 20 feet, we had natural light, <clears throat> and we did not intend to shoot in this grassy meadow that gives Emo Turtle Grass Meadow its name. We had picked a site off the coast of Key Largo that had like travel brochure clarity and it was the plan. And then I was really incredibly fortunate to be able to partner with an organization called Diving with a Purpose on the production of the shoot and in bringing together to di the dive team. And Diving with a Purpose works on conserving and, and preserving maritime heritage around the world, but specifically with a focus on the African diaspora. And so it was just a true honor to be able to connect with Diving with a Purpose and it was on a phone call with their founder, um, Ken Stewart, that I learned that I could not put tripods on the seabed anywhere in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary without a permit that was going to take like many, many, many months to get. And the site visit was planned and the plane tickets were booked. And the, you know this moment where everything's together, you're on a timeline, you have the people, you have the plan. And then, and I said to Ken, like, that's no problem. We just won't shoot in the in the sanctuary. And he said, well, what? Where exactly would that be? You know, so this was a moment. And um, but but what he did was connect me with someone from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, with whom DWP works very closely, who put me in touch with this amazing life-saving woman at um at at Biscayne National Park. And because this because the parks permit separately from the sanctuary, I know I'm really in the weeds here, so to speak. Um, we were able to get a permit the day before we all flew to Florida. So Astrid Santini, wherever you are, I'm forever grateful to you. But what happened was we moved from the site that we thought would be ideal to a site that was a meadow with um with seagrass that sequesters carbon, with grass that's oxygenating the waters, with um, with a, a real sort of agent against the changing and warming ocean. And we wound up in this elegiac kind of murky space with waving grass. And um, and so that's how we came to be in this turtle grass meadow at Alina's Reef in, um, in the Florida Keys. So I, I really would just wanna say a few, um, a few words about the kind of core ideas that drove the research for Meditation Ocean, which I've been 
working on, I, you know, this idea sort of began in 2018. So this was five years from start to finish. Um, and so really thinking about these different, um, these different vectors or modes of interconnection of, of non-duality. And so the first one to just speak to a bit is this, um, this connection between individual and community well-being. And so I'm just going to read this quote, which you've probably read some already. Um, this is from Alexis Pauline Gums, who wrote an incredible book that came out in 2020 as I was researching this project called Undrowned Black Feminist Lessons for Marine Mammals. And she writes, what if school, as we used it on a daily basis, signaled not the name of a process or institution through which we could be indoctrinated, not a structure through which social capital was grasped and policed, but something more organic, like a scale of care. What if school was the scale at which we could care for each other and move together? In my view, at this moment in history, that is what we need to learn most urgently. And so um, also really thinking about the interbeing of human and more than human species. How do we back off this notion that we are the, we are the exceptional um, we are the exceptional animal and find our place in in um, amongst the other species with whom we share the planet? And so this um, incredible quote from Amitav Ghosh's *The Nutmeg's Curse: Parables for a Planet in Crisis*, which focuses on the research of Julia Adney Thomas. Perhaps what is at fault here is the very idea of a single species. It is now known that the human body contains vast numbers of microorganisms of various kinds. Biologists estimate that 90% of the human body consists of bacteria rather than human cells. And one microbiologist has suggested that under a microscope, a human body looks more like a coral reef, an assemblage of life forms living together. And another really, um, critical area of intention for Meditation Ocean is the non-separateness of the social and the environmental and all of the ways these, um, these phenomena um, are linked and the ways in which environmental forces press in on the social and vice versa. So um, this text from an article in Sierra from December of 2020 from marine biologist and ocean advocate, Ayana Elizabeth Johnson, who says, we need ocean justice. While the concept of environmental justice defined by the US Environmental Protection Agency as the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies may have finally permeated the zeitgeist. The concept seems to end at the shore. Communities of color and poor communities remain most disastrously affected by pollution, overfishing, human rights abuses, loss of coastal ecosystems, storms strengthened by climate change, and sea level rise. Tackling these challenges will require working at all levels from micro local to global and building political power. We cannot afford to wait for governments and international bodies to lead. We, coastal communities who have the most at stake, must chart a path out of this mess mostly not our making. Okay, so um, some, some, some kind of key ideas strung together now and maybe a moment to just uh, reflect, sit with, and I'm going to share the trailer that we made for Emo Turtlegrass Meadow. This is like four or five minutes long and um, maybe just gives us a chance to experience and sense into the piece in a different way.
Okay, so as you can see, the um, there are no cuts in the piece. The scenes all shimmer out through those soft blurs, and they're really meant to give people in the gallery moments of pause. If they want to close their eyes, there's not always something happening on all of the screens. And so we started that in the swirling project and used the language of the shimmer. Um, I'm going to let some sound play while I talk a little bit about the MO sound. So, um, so the piece is 67 minutes looping, and the score is ambient in the space with a channel married to each of the six screens. And a lot of the sound comes from the underwater environment. So because sound travels so well underwater, the camera sound is very good. But also, um, we gathered sound with two with stereo hydrophones over a man-made reef off the coast of West Palm, Florida. So a lot of the kind of crackling of the reef comes from those very shallow water recordings. But all of the, um, and also Josh made the score, he broke it into tracks and made it into an album, which you can listen to whenever you like. And, um, and for each project, a single kind of instrument comes forward for the musical elements of the work. And for Emo Turtlegrass Meadow, it was the human voice. And so, um, so Josh Quarles recorded four students from the School of Music under the direction of their faculty, Lisa Fusco, in the Cathedral of the Sacred Heart, which is just off campus, and recorded long sustained notes, which were then, um, turned into an instrument on a synthesizer, which was used to make the musical elements of the score. Okay, so I'm gonna try to not do this horribly abruptly and just go to the next slide. Um, so, so the score comprises not only this ambient sound, but 10 commissioned meditations that were written by a mix of ocean scientists and meditation teachers, choreographer, poet, um, different, 10 different voices kind of moving through with these meditation scripts, which played out of these small speakers, these in-wall speakers in two places in the gallery. So you could just kind of give yourself over to the ambient score of the piece, or you could sit with a guide in meditation, and they were on um, two separate reels, but also there were QR codes in the gallery, so you could pull up your own script, make your choice, listen in the space, or listen outside of the gallery. And just to share that the, um, the, the scripts are all available as audio recordings on meditationocean.com and as texts. And just to give you a very short sample, this is not actually pulled from the piece, but, but it's just a sense of what it would feel like to be in the gallery, hearing the piece, seeing the piece, and listening to one of the practices, if you wanted that guidance. Knowing that molecules drift together by chance, answering a sense of incompleteness, craving stability, so joining, growing together and dissolving. Calcite, aragonite, Stop on church. Um, so uh, again, to point to learning in public practice and the director of LPP, Dion Custer Edwards, who sort of oversaw all of the programs that were housed by Meditation Ocean. And as this is um, the kind of first presentation that I've pulled together after completing the project, I can see that we should have brought like snacks and pillows and sleeping bags. So I'm going to just move us sort of towards the towards the end. But there's there's sort of more to share here. And, and so I'll try to do it with some degree of pith. But um, but what you're seeing here are images of Central Ohio high school students who were in um, 
an art and writing program called Pages, who came over the course of several field trips to see the exhibitions that were on view and to spend time in Meditation Ocean in service of an anthology of writing and art that they produced at the end of the school year, just also to give you a sense of, of people in the space. There was a series called Breathe, an artist-led meditation series, and I did two sessions. Um, the poet Anaïs Duplan did two sessions, and the artist Kadeen Navarro did two sessions. And my first session was sort of underwater in the meditation ocean space, and the next was on these skinny little boardwalks, a walking meditation workshop over two kidney-shaped wetlands at the OSU Experimental Wetlands Park. So we had this moment of, of being together underwater and then being together on the water, on land. There were two exchanges with the Bird Polar and Climate Research Center on OSU's campus. Um, one for artists, climate scientists, and staff members. Each went for um, guided practice in the meditation ocean space and then a tour of, um, of Bird Polar. And there was this real interest on the part of Bird because of the amount of um, stress on the scientists that are working on climate. And we did this with high school students too. So a tour of Bird, and then time spent in the in the installation. And then also to shout out the Art and Resilience Program, whose student leaders got um, very involved with. Um, participating in Meditation Ocean, but also amplifying it from the point of view and of art and resilience to students around OSU's campus. I wanna, <clears throat> I wanna say something about floating because one of the things that, um, that one of the things that awareness practice or meditation practice um, is afforded underwater is buoyancy. We talk so much about um, in meditation practice, we talk so much about grounding, about grounding the nervous system, about grounding with the earth and what's possible underwater is to take a deep breath, right? Which in Vipassana practice, which is a um, very old form of Buddhist practice, we talk about the inhale as rising. And when you inhale underwater, you lift off the seabed and rise. And so this notion of inhale, rise, exhale, fall, takes on a kind of different sense underwater. And so there was the possibility of, of having this sort of hovering new, um, new way of practicing. And um, Melody Jew, who writes about kind of milieu specific thinking and notions of grounding in terms of a terrestrial framework and what happens when we bring that into the water, when we're not working with this notion of, the, of, of, of land, what happens, um, what happens to, what happens in a watery milieu and a buoyant milieu. And she writes, I reflected that perhaps buoyancy control itself offers a kind of ethics as a mindful negotiation of oneself and a practice of care with the aspiration of being as minimally disruptive as possible. And she writes, although scuba diving is more conventionally associated with scientific research or maritime industries, I see diving as a method of cognitive estrangement that makes visible the terrestrial biases that have calcified in the way we figuratively speak about the world. This is very interested in, in what exploring this practice underwater might, um, might give just in the way of experience, both to the divers and also to the viewers breathing with them in the space. I'm coming back now again to this notion of, of porosity. So the sponge, phylum periphera, all pores, no inside, no outside, a, a, a totally porous and watery body. And I think this gets to some of these notions of connectedness that I'm talking about. And um, Astrid and Amanis writing in bodies of water, post-human feminist phenomenal phenomenology, phenomenology talks about um, these, these talks about our role in the hydrocommons, our role on this watery planet, our role as, as, as collective watery bodies. She writes, 
Our planet's life proliferating and life sustaining gestational milieus are wounded. Aqueous habitats in the Great Barrier Reef, in the Gulf of Mexico, in the Alberta tar sands, in the Niger Delta, are sacrificed to human fossil fuel dependency, while rain and snow become poisonous messengers to Arctic food change. Seas, both tiny and grand, suffer from slow suffocation. Ancient aquifers are pumped out of the earth to be bottled and sold for profit, most recently under the banner of life. We slake our consumer's thirst with melting glaciers to end up rowing lifeboats down the middle of our flooded streets. Monolithic mega dams displace humans and other animals to radically reshape riparian ecosystems. New islands of plastic rise out of the sea, while old caches of chemical warfare agents lie patiently beneath, slowly releasing distant memories. Understanding how water has reached this state of degradation and exploitation asks us to carefully consider our own implications within this hydro commons in terms not only of what we do to water, but as water bodies ourselves. And in a way, I think this points to some of the sort of spirituality that is, 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 um, being explored in this ocean space in in this meditation ocean project and just to just to share um this thought about as about ocean as an analog for the spiritual in a 1927 letter to freud that's freud himself um romaine roland a french novelist playwright coined the phrase oceanic feeling to refer to a sensation of eternity a feeling of being one with the external world as a whole inspired by the example of Ramakrishna, among other mystics. According to Roland, this feeling is the source of all the religious energy that permeates in various religious systems. And one may justifiably call oneself religious on the basis of this oceanic feeling alone, even if one renounces every belief and every illusion. Love that description of oceanic feeling. And then echoed with a few quotes from the Meditation Ocean scripts, quoting Rumi, scriptwriter Tiffany Kendrick writes, you are not a drop in the ocean, you are the entire ocean in a drop. And Nicolas Dumit Estevez Raful Espejo Ovalles writes, water, you two are in me, and we carry each other through life in life. Water, you two are in me, and we carry each other through life in life. Just a few um, images of repose in the space. Also folks going to the space to do homework, to read. Um, and just as a segue, this is like maybe we're down to the last two slides very quickly, a segue to some of the resources of the project, the gallery guide with a text by Melody Jew and a poem by Anais Duplan. Um, as well as a site statement kind of acknowledging the social factors of Alina's Reef in the Florida Keys, and a very robust um, learning guide put together for all of the exhibitions in that cycle, um, all of which can be found on the meditationocean.com website. And soon to be published, a climate impact report conducted about the exhibition at the Wexner Center through an organization called Artist Commit, which is um, partnered with or part of an organization called Galleries Commit, which offers a very robust um, way of reporting on the environmental impacts, big focus on carbon of exhibition making. So another way to look at, uh, to look at the sort of sustainability of sustainable exhibitions, um, which have a way to go, but in the space of urgency around transmitting and making meaning and connecting over the issues. Okay, we've reached the eel. Um, this is the, this is the, the end eel. So, um, thank you. Yeah. Oh yeah, okay, now the hot seats. Exactly. <sighs> now we do the talk show. Um, but mostly I'm Thank just, you very much. I'll be here all week. I will. Uh, yeah. 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 Man, that was good. Um, I'm teeing it up for Morgan, okay. the sickest oh, yeah. tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Maybe I'll ask I'm the sorry. first question and then and then I'm hoping you all ask some. I was just thinking 
every, I mean, do you ever stop and think if you had to say what is the work, what is the work, or is it all of it? Oh, gosh. Um, it's, it's all of it. I mean, um, and I'm not sure. I mean, I really do think of the work in terms of the project. I think of these as um, Sponge, Land Dive Team, Meditation Ocean. I think of them as projects, as collaborations, and um, yeah, as, as intersection of a kind of lived practice and a making outcome. Yeah, and process, yeah. and people. Yeah, yeah, and pe um, people are critical. I mean, to this whole, to even though it, it feels very singular, singularly you, mm -hmm. there's also such beautiful contributions yeah. from your team. And more than people, yeah. you know, yeah. like yeah. our, the end deal. Yeah. Okay. How about from some of you? Hi. Hi, Lily. <laughs> so uh, you mentioned, uh, uh, um, uh, so like, thank you for the explanation for, especially for the sound for that piece, because I was sort of thinking of that. Uh, and I'm kind of curious, because you mentioned when people breathing in the scuba dive suit, there are a lot of sounds. So I wonder when they're meditating in the water. So what exactly sound do mm, they mm. hear? Uh, apart from, I guess, do they, do they, do you also play that sort of nice music in mm. the water? Yeah. No, the soundscape underwater is really the hiss of the, of the scuba regulator pulling air in from the tank and the big gurgly bubbly exhale. And as long as you're alive and breathing underwater for any length of time, you're going to hear a lot of the breath sounds from the scuba gear. So to get those crackling reef sounds, which people attribute to um, shrimp, though it's also really thought to be a mystery where all of these sounds of the reef really come from, you, um, you, you have to kind of hold your breath to hear them. But what the camera can do is record the sounds when people swim away. So a lot of the audio is just setting the camera up on the weighted tripod. We can get a lot of the audio through the video, setting the camera up, swimming away. Um, yeah, and if, if the sound recordist and composer has anything to add, um, they can. <laughs> Okay, that was a pass. Yeah. <laughs> um, wonderful talk. Thank you, Hope. Um, I was wondering what uh, relation, I guess, at what point or what relationship does research have within your work? Obviously, mm. there a lot of research probably goes into it, but um, how does it fit in in how you, like when you're kind of conceiving mm. of a project yeah. i mean i i feel like um i know there happens to be a seminar about that on on, on right. um in the department this semester sure. how does it how does it work i mean i i want to make sure i really answer your question because i feel like i could ramble about this and say many obvious things i think i think the work is is driven by um the desire to learn and one of the things the work is driven by is a desire to learn and a kind of a kind of pragmatism, a kind of learning by doing, right? And so a lot of the research or the learning um, kind of comes through the doing, which is a way that can focus attention. But alongside that, there is reading and watching and talking and sort of discerning what what conversations this work is a part of what information is very inspiring or what you know are you know i've had moments where something i read like catalyzed a whole piece with the case of meditation ocean there was like a you know somebody asked me if i would write something about it for uh for a potential exhibition and i'm sure after this talk this will come as no surprise to you but i wrote like 12 pages and was like is this and um and a bibliography so um which is on the meditationocean.com website. So a lot of research, both like um, 
reading, learning, talking, but then also getting to the seabed with eight other people and figuring out what that's about. And, um, and maybe the last thing I'll say about that is it's not just learning, it's this real interest in knowledge exchange and, and in that practice of exchange, which was one of the reasons the sponge kind of um, stole my heart. Hello. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on um, COVID and maybe the tint of COVID on this practice because of our emphasis on breath. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, yeah, thanks, HH. I mean, I I had an inkling that this project was going to, you know, the, the thought of the project kind of came to me in about 2018, and I had an inkling that it was going to be funded um, in the, in the, let me, let me see, in very early 2020. And I was wrapping up a project in Florida. And then I found out like, okay, this project is a go. And, and that was in spring of 2020. So the COVID pandemic, you know, that time of, of the sort of intersecting COVID pandemic and uprising around systemic racism in this country, which we all well, I'm not going to say we all, which was felt profoundly in the city of Richmond where I was researching this project. These factors really drove the research and intention around Meditation Ocean. And so a lot of thought about, um, about all of the vectors of breath, fearing other people's breath um, th through the pandemic. Um, I can't breathe. Who is a, a, a target of of racialized violence and and robbed of breath. And so breath was um, something very powerful to sit with in the making of this work, as well as um, the, 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 the importance of holding the social alongside of the environmental when considering the climate crisis in this work. Um, and Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson, who I quoted from Sierra, had an incredible op-ed in the Washington Post in June of 2020 about um, the relationship of racism and the climate crisis. And so, so you asked about breath, but I think impossible to tease it apart from all of the other factors and focuses of the, of the desire to make a piece and then really think about the piece being a piece about attention and what needs paying attention to. And then to engage that in a, in a collaborative group where my voice is not the central voice and build a project based on porosity where voices could come through in the scripts, in the writing for the gallery guide and in all of the programming. So anyway, I'll take a breath now and um, thanks HH. Hi, I was just wondering about your relationship with meditation and if you had one before you started this project or if that was a newfound thing. Yeah. And like how you meditated underwater with all of those sounds and what that kind of experience was like. And if you ever thought about using that experience for a, another piece or some kind of visualization. Yeah, yeah. So my experience with meditation, this is like, this is in danger of getting, again, like really long winded. It is my way. Um, you know, uh, where to begin? I mean, I will say that um, that I have a, a daily practice that um, Buddhist meditation was introduced to me by a very beloved therapist in New York City in the late 90s. And it just so happened that the village Zen Center was in the same building as the textile company where I worked. And that textile company, by the way, donated all of the fabric for the installation, which is 10% recycled ocean plastic and 90%, um, this is design text for my interior designers in the room, and 90% um, recycled post, I gotta get this right, post-consumer polyester. Anyway, you were asking about meditation and now I'm selling you a textile. Mm -hmm. The point is that I went to the village Zen Center in that same building and started a practice, but my, my, my own meditation practice didn't really, um, kind of deepen until 
around 2014 and then 2018, at around the time that I had the thought of making this work, um, I started doing some online trainings with an organization called Mindful Schools that teaches mindfulness in um, public K-12. And also a VCU alum from painting, Mamie Donsker, who works, is now the director of an organization called Tools for Peace, um, which has a program called Stop, Breathe and Think. And I, I, in order to sort of learn how to teach alongside my practice, went to be a, an art camp counselor at the Tools for Peace summer team camp for two summers. And, um, and also I offer a free online weekly guided meditation on Zoom every Monday morning at, um, at 9 a.m. We're off the call by 9.30, promise. And if you don't wanna to talk to anyone after you sit, you can hop off the call at 9.20. And, um, and we blow kisses and say bye. And I'm very happy to share that link with anyone who wants to come. You're invited. And um, yeah, my email is just hqginsburg at VCU. Does that, it, it has to answer the question because otherwise we'll be here all night. Okay, thank you. Hi, Chase. Can you talk a little bit about your graduate school experience? It sounds like you participated in a pretty exceptional or interesting graduate program and how that maybe set the stage for the direction that your research has taken. Yeah, thank you for that question. I mean, Sponge began when I was in grad school. Uh, Sponge was my thesis project that I came to. Which, am I connected? Are we interacting enough? I don't know. We're like right where do you feel okay I'm just over here there, for Steve? like security. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. It's helping. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Just to admire too. Well, so so I so Sponge was my thesis project, and then I rolled into our graduate KI seminar that following fall. That's right. Yeah, I was probably talking about sponges all the time then too. You were, but in, wonderfully. Yeah, and so um, so anyway, I went to I went to MIT, which has this this. Um, this kind of maxim of mind and hand. So it's a real like learning by doing environment. It's also, um, you know, like heaven for those of us who embrace nerd culture. And so I really went there in a way to sort of be a sponge. And I wanted to really like absorb everything that I could absorb as someone who did not fare especially well in high school science classes. Um, and. And so I sort of at some point even said, like, I, I came here to be a sponge, and there was this question about, okay, well, I'm very clear on how to absorb, but it was a moment in my practice, which I think of as very connected to an art and life lineage, where I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to um, offer in exchange for all of the absorption. So there was a real confusion in grad school about, like, what form is this lived practice meant to take? There's another version of this talk that involves like a crisis on an organic farm in Northeastern Pennsylvania. Um, but, uh, but anyway, that notion of the sponge as a kind of muse in exchange was born in that program, which was very open-ended in terms of where you could move around the Institute and, um, and what kinds of stuff you could take on. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I had a question about like the relationship in terms of pressure. I think when you're talking about meditation, it's like a relief of pressure, right? But then you're going deep down underwater to meditate, which is putting pressure on you. So could you like speak a little bit about your relationship with pressure and like yeah, meditation? That's so interesting. I mean, awareness practice as a kind of any time you know, release from a certain kind of pressure. But when you're diving, you really only have a sense of the pressure in an embodied way when you're changing your position in the water. And so as you're diving down all of the air cavities in your body, you feel the pressure and you have to clear these air spaces, right? And it's why when you're rising in the water, you have to keep breathing and continually exhale so the pressure doesn't build up. So these are these things you're aware of when you're learning to do it. But when you are underwater, there is not a feeling of pressure. There is a feeling of flying. You know, you are weightless. You can navigate with your breath. And, and there's no sense of the water bearing down on you. You can swim out over a, over a wall and just feel like you're flying out into space. Um, and so it's just a really different environment to play with some of these experiences of embodiment. And of course, 
the breath operates very differently. It literally is how you move. It's how you steer. It's how you rise and, and how you um, fall. You can play with this in the bathtub too, by the way. Okay, I think we have to stop, but I have two important messages. Okay. Um, tomorrow is Hope's birthday. Oh, Stephen. Yes. <laughs> okay. Oh my God. So. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So when you're when you're meditating in the bathtub, you will we'll, think of me yeah. always. Yes. No, maybe I don't know. Uh, and then the next VCU Arts lecture will be this Friday, October 6th at um, uh, VCU Arts Painting and Printmaking alumna, Loie Hollowell. The lecture will take place at the Gray Street Theater at 12 p.m. and details are on the VCU Arts event webpage. Thanks. Thank you everybody and thank you to Hope. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Stephen.